All right, Katie, I think we're all set to let people in. Okay. Hey everyone, we're just going to give it a, another minute to see if we can have a few more people join us. I see some friendly faces. Hi, Keith, Gwendolyn. Chris. Oops. All right, Katie, what do you think? Should we get started? Okay. Um, so welcome everyone. This is the last session of the uh, Western uh, MHP's uh, Western Mass Housing Conference. Um, this is has been adapted from us, uh, a conference that we hope to do in April, but of course got canceled. So we kind of stretched it out over to a virtual series and um, this concludes the, uh, the sessions. So um, if you have missed some of them or um, want to look back at uh, our sessions, we have been recording these and posting them on the um, Housing Toolbox website. Um, so you can access the recording there. Today's will be also recorded. Um, just since this is the last one, we wanted to take a moment to say a special thanks to our regional partners for helping us put this, um, the, the whole series together, all the sessions, um, and for organizing many of the sessions. Um, so just to name them, it, we, we, our partners are MACDC, the Mass Association of Community Development Corporations, Berkshire Regional Housing Commission, Franklin Regional Council, Council of Governments, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, and Central Mass Regional Planning Commission. So we really appreciate all the work you did. And um, as Chris mentioned earlier, when we were getting started, this work hasn't slowed down. If anything, it's um, community development work has increased and became become more difficult in some ways. So we really appreciate you being here. Um, we also wanted to say thank you for the feedback you've been providing and we hope you, we encourage you to continue to um, reach out about the different any feedback you have on on these sessions we've done and finally we'd like to um, extend an invitation if any of these sessions has sparked um, ideas in your communities please feel free to follow up with us and um, we're happy to work with you moving forward. So with that, just a few um, housekeeping items, um, questions. Um, we're gonna be throwing those in the chat as usual. Um, Pat um, or Patricia will um, uh, introduce in a minute, will said that she'll, they're happy to take some questions as they go along through the panel. Um, so yeah, just throw any questions you might have or any comments in there and we can stop as we move along and check in. Um, so before I introduce our panel, I just wanted to give our spiel of who we are. Um, so we're MHP. I'm here with my colleague Katie Lacey, who many of you have um, heard introduce us throughout these last seven weeks. Um, we are, let me move forward. 
So we are a quasi public agency. We've been around since 1985. And we, what the work we do is creating innovative policy and financing solutions um, to help provide, um, expand housing throughout Massachusetts. Um, and we do this by our community assistance team, which is Katie Lacey and myself. We have a, um, a rental finance team that provides permanent financing for multifamily rental housing throughout the state. Our one mortgage program, which is the most affordable um, first time home buyer program in the state. And then we have our center for housing data, which provides some research on housing data to help support, support your policy efforts at the local level. So let me stop sharing. There we go. So today we have a panel panel discussion and it's, and so we'll be hearing from Patricia Mullins from uh, Berkshire Regional Planning Commission. Um, she's the community and, Devel community and economic development program manager there. Um, and we'll, and on this panel, we have Brian McHugh from regional, McHugh from regional county, or Franklin Regional County Housing Authority, or Franklin County Regional Housing Authority, there we go. Uh, Doug Demaris from Hilltown CDC, and then Chris Dunphy from Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. And they're gonna talk about um, using the, C the community development block grant program and um, how uh, for funding housing rehab and how organizations in this re region is, are doing that. So uh, with, with that, I'll hand it over to Pat. So oh, thank you, Katie. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to be here today. I'm I'm really appreciative of um, all you folks that are. Oh dear, I hope I'm. Oh, that's just you. That's that's. Uh, sorry, folks. I'm trying to figure out who's muted and who isn't. But it's not me that's muted. So I guess I better roll on. Um, anyway, I'm glad to see you all. Um, I actually uh, kind of browsed through um, who was attending, and I did see lots of folks um, that I know. Um, I just wanted to. Um, uh, give a brief shout out to Pat Byrne, who is on this call, and I'm very excited to, to see that she's here. Um, I think that Pat uh, probably coached me through the very first CDBG grant application I wrote for um, Housing Rehab, so it's nice to see that she's on this call. Um, but anyway, I want to thank you all for being here on a great day, um, a beautiful day that is kind of unexpectedly uh, lovely out there and for sharing your lunch break with us. Um, and I also would like to thank um, MHP for following through with this. Um, so the whole concept behind um, the Western Mass Housing Conference um, was um, you know, originally to bring more of the, um, the sessions that we normally get from the, um, from the Housing Institute um, out, out to the Western region so that, so that more uh, town officials and planners and um, interested um, housing advocates could share um, in some of these sessions without having to travel to Devon's um, you know, each, each year to do that. And we appreciate the fact that you have continued to, to support this idea by having this conference um, and, and having adapted during the pandemic um, and finding a way to bring um, these sessions. And actually, I don't see why we just don't continue. Why should we even end? We should just keep going. So, um, so again, uh, you know, Katie mentioned the, the folks that are on the panel with me. I just wanna um, say um, that I really appreciate them joining me um, in this Chris Dumphy from Pioneer Valley uh, Planning Commission. He's the, uh, uh, principal planner manager there. Um, and Chris has a, a real wealth of uh, experience um, with CDBG. He started in the, the late 1990s. So he's got 21 years <laughs> of uh, CDBG experience. And um, over the course of that time, he didn't always work on housing rehab, but since he has been working on housing rehab, he's probably followed through with about a thousand units of and rehabilitated, you know, or had a hand in rehabilitating about a thousand units. Um, so that's that's pretty impressive. Um, Brian McGew is the director of community development at the Franklin County Regional Housing Authority. Um, 
he started out um, 30 years ago at working as a rehab specialist and uh, construction coordinator. And um, he's, he's been in this for a long, long time. Um, and uh, over the years, he's, he's uh, sort of changed titles, but it sounds like he's still doing the same old thing, which is having rehab. <laughs> um, and um, he's probably, he and, and uh, his agency have probably over the last 40 or 50 years, the agency itself and, and with his help, um, have done about 2,700 units. It's the most amazing thing, really. So um, big shout out there. And Doug, um, Doug Desmaris is a construction manager and rehab specialist. I know he is currently working um, for the Hilltown C CDC, but he may also be working for other programs. And I know he is, um, comes uh, to us from some distance and he covers the state from the Hilltowns to all the way out to out around Boston and the Newton area. So we're very happy to have him um, and his expertise uh, to discuss um, housing rehab from his point of view. Um, so the housing, the housing rehab programs that we are talking about today really represent one of the best ways to preserve the existing affordable housing um, in Western Massachusetts. Uh, we have very um, old um, uh, aging, um, uh, housing stock out here that, um, you know, we have a lot of issues with lead paint, with, um, with um, all different types of deferred maintenance um, issues um, in housing. And this is all happening at a time when um, there's, a, there's an increased amount of pressure on our uh, communities to supply housing. Uh, really, the whole issue of housing and the whole point behind this conference is to try to address um, ways to alleviate what is not just a, a growing problem, but is actually a crisis in, in Massachusetts in terms of what housing, you know, um, uh, choices we have to, to, to provide for people. Um, the, the, the housing rehab program is run by the Community Development Block Grant Program. And that program is a HUD funded program that has been in existence since 1974. It came into being under Title I of the Housing and Community Development um, Act of 1974. So it's been around for a really long time. CDBG um, should be of interest to, to our municipalities, excuse me, municipalities because we can just do so many different things with it. It's not just about housing rehab. We can do um, all types of um, public infrastructure. We can do, um, uh, we can address ADA um, um, problems with our municipal buildings. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different sorts of things that we can do, but the thing that's probably the most um, recognized is housing rehab. Um, so um, I think really the best way to um, talk to you about how, if you're completely um, new to the topic and you've never, you don't know anything at all about CDBG, but you represent a community that's interested in, in, in possibly applying for a CDBG um, grant. I think that, that the best thing to do is just hop on Google, um, Google Massachusetts Department of Housing and Community Development CDBG. Make sure you put the Massachusetts in there because as it turns out, um, Virginia also has a Department of Housing and Community Development. You don't wanna wind up looking at the, the wrong program um, that is um, you know, in a different state. But um, Massachusetts Department of Housing and Community Development does administer this program in, in Massachusetts, but the funding originally does come from HUD. So we have sort of a step down situation where um, each year HUD, provides an allocation to the states and the states then administer their programs. For FY20, which um, uh, applications were due for that, for that program for CDBG um, this past year, right before COVID hit. And so we all um, were under a tremendous amount of pressure from December to mid-March and we submitted our applications and we were all looking for um, you know, a, a funding from uh, the approximately $33 million that, that um, DHCD had to um, allocate to the different communities. And um, unfortunately, that's exactly when COVID hit and um, 
we have all had to turn our attention to other things. So um, DHCD has been working really hard to um, uh, allocate the funds that they have received from HUD in response to the pandemic. And um, they, you know, we are all working on um, micro assistance to micro enterprise businesses and rental assistance and mortgage assistance and this and that. Um, and as a result, the, um, the, the uh, awards for the current year CDBG grants are just still pending. And we're really anxious and looking forward to hearing how those have um, turned out. But um, in any case, everyone is extremely busy. Um, we've all had you know, uh, a lot of challenges in trying to adapt our, our um, programs to um, the current conditions. And um, we have really never stopped providing some part of the services that we provide to, to communities for housing rehab. We've really never stopped doing that throughout the entire um, pandemic. Um, we've all you know, adjusted to working from home, working from our basements, our attics, and, and um, you know, uh, but one way or another, we are processing applications and, um, and making arrangements for whatever work can be done without um, endangering our construction crews and our homeowners. So that's where we are right now with housing we have um, out in Western Massachusetts. Um, so let's see what else I can tell you about the program. I think, again, um, if you are uh, representing a municipality that has never had a CDBG grant and you're wondering how it all works, I will tell you that um, um, all of the funding does flow from Massachusetts Department of Housing and Community Development directly to a municipality, or uh, you know, we can also have a regional grant, which would be, um, but still has a lead community and it all flows directly through a municipality. Um, and what that means is that the municipality can apply for the grant on its own. Um, and there's usually a, a cycle, it usually happens that we can submit our grants somewhere around um, the beginning, the first quarter of the year. However, if your community doesn't feel like they have the capacity, if you don't have planners to work on this, if you don't have a community development department, there are still avenues for you to um, follow where you can uh, apply for one of these grants. And this is where the regional um, planning commissions um, and other types of regional agencies, such as the one that, that Brian represents, um, the, the the Franklin County Regional Housing Authority, this is where you can, um, your community can access some assistance in applying for one of these grants. Um, there is uh, a tremendous amount of um, community involvement in the entire grant um, application process. It, be, it begins, the community involvement begins well before the grant application goes in. Um, and so, you know, it's helpful to have some folks who can um, help guide you through that. In addition to the, um, the regional planning uh, uh, commissions and, and regional agencies, there are also some very excellent um, consultants, private consultants out there who can help guide the community through the application process. And it's very, very helpful to have that, that um, assistance, especially the first time a community goes through the process because it, it is quite complex. Um, so I just wanted to, um, you know, kind of let you know that um, we're always available to take calls to discuss whether or not your community is, is in a position to um, apply for a grant and any of the folks that are on this um, conference uh, uh, today could probably help you out in that respect if you're interested in, in moving forward with a grant. Pat, um, I think Chris wanted to add something with what you just said. I'm hoping he will because I'm a little bit out of breath. <laughs> Hi, y'all. Um, I just want to um, make sure everyone understands that, uh, as Patricia said, this is a federal program, okay? Every year, Congress has to go to bat and, and decide on an allocation for this program. Now, I see most of the people here are, uh, first of all, Patricia, Brian, Doug and I come from a state uh, funded perspective in the DHCD, uh, but this is a federal program. So when an allocation is made at the federal level in Congress, 
a, a bulk of these dollars are directed to entitlement cities. And I just want to recognize we do have a, a gentleman here representing one of our entitlement cities, and that's Keith Benoit from Northampton. Hi, Keith. Uh, so he works directly with HUD. And so he doesn't really have anything to do with the state funded program. Uh, all that being said, you know, the, 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 the main um, um, idea of housing rehab remains the same, whether it's, you know, uh, funded you know, directly from the, the federal government to the entitlement city, such as Northampton, or whether it flows through the through the state, the DHCD, and to these other smaller communities that apply competitively. So I just wanted to recognize that, you know, um, I, I see most of the people here I see are probably uh, affiliated with the state program, but uh, Keith doesn't really have to deal with the DHCD and he deals directly with HUD representatives. So I just wanted to make that distinction. And that's a good point. There's 37 um, entitlement communities in out of all of the, uh, 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 cities and towns in Massachusetts. So um, 37, as you said, um, actually receive their funding directly from HUD and, um, and report to them um, and work with them directly. And then we have, I think it's about 13 mini entitlement communities, that, um, but, but the mini entitlements are communities that have um, uh, uh, a, a low to moderate income population that reaches uh, above 40%. Um, there needs to be at least um, 12,000 people in the community. And um, Girl. one other thing. Um, and, and the poverty rate has to be higher than the average 0.8% um, uh, across, um, across the state. So those are the, the, um, the, the things that make a, a community a mini entitlement. And they still receive their funding from Massachusetts Department of Housing and Community Development However, um, the difference is that, that a certain amount is set aside for those communities each year. And rather than file a competitive application, as do the rest of the communities, um, they are guaranteed that they will receive a certain amount of money. They do have to, to, um, to support any um, planned activities with a, a, a pretty comprehensive plan that they submit around the same time that we do the competitive grants. So one way or another, um, every city and town in Massachusetts is eligible to be um, considered for a CDBG grant. So um, that's a little bit about how the program runs. It's pretty complex. I understand this is a once over lightly, um, but you certainly can give us a call or you can check out the Massachusetts Department of Housing and Community Development website and get more information, more specific information on this. So um, at this point, what I would like to do is just kind of focus in a little bit more um, on housing rehab. And I wanna turn it over to Brian, who's going to talk to us about um, what the process is like for setting up um, uh, a program, taking applications and, and what the, um, what the um, parameters are for uh, individual um, housing rehab projects and, and what the applicant can expect as a process. So Brian, if you want to take over from here, I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that intro, intro, uh, Pat. Um, when I started, I, I had a lot more hair and in a lot uh, less gray hair, of course. So um, anyway, uh, thanks for, uh, for having me today. This is going to be a, a brief overview. Some of these topics we could spend an entire day on. So bear with me if, it's, if, if I don't touch on all the points. Um, but if you do uh, apply for um, a grant, whether it's uh, through a municip municipality or through an agency, um, you'll have already, um, you know, written a component of that grant, which is the housing rehab program. Um, I can't stress enough the importance of establishing clear policies and processes before implementing a program. Um, DHCD does have a technical guide on housing rehab, and they do have a, a CDBG manual um, that uh, includes chapter 20, which also um, uh, spells out how a housing rehab program can be run um, and certain requirements that you have um, in running that program, reporting requirements, eligibility requirements, and all that. Um, so if, you, you know, if, if you're awarded, you've already developed a program and you should definitely stick with it. DHCD will expect that. There are different ways of running the program. 
but they will always come back to you and say, if you go to them with a question, they'll often turn around and say, well, what is your, what's your policy? What did, you, what did your grant say? So uh, remember how you wrote the, wrote the grant and, and again, stick with it. Um, so uh, we also, you know, we also develop further guidelines that aren't in an application that explain the eligibility, what to expect, timelines, et cetera. Uh, for homeowners, we provide them with a step-by-step -step, step -step procedures uh, manual and uh, general information guideline um, manual also so that they, they can, we, you know, they can always refer back to that um, if things become confusing, what, what happens next, uh, how do I handle this situation? Um, so they, it's something that they, they get, you know, with the application packet and they sign off on that they've read it and understand it. Um, there's a lot of information in there. People are not going to retain all of that, but it's nice to have something where you can go back to and say, well, you know, in section so-and-so, this is, this is the process for, for dealing with this, or this is what you can expect um, during this phase of the, of the, of the program. Um, but you know, first and foremost, um, housing rehab program, if it's funded through CDBG, it has to uh, benefit, it has to meet a national objective. Um, and a national objective for housing rehab programs is to serve low to moderate income households. Um, in this area, low to moderate income, it's, it's 80% of the area mean uh, median income. Um, in this area in Franklin County, it starts at $47,850 for one person a four person household of $68,300. So you have to be under that in order to qualify for uh, a housing rehab loan. Um, so if you, you know, if again, if you're awarded, um, you're gonna have, you know, you, you may have a pool of uh, people on a waiting list that, um, that you've, you know, uh, identified in a certain area, whether it's a town or something, uh, Patricia mentioned a regional application. Uh, sometimes we run programs that include multiple towns. Um, if you've applied for the for uh, a grant, um, then you've you've typically uh, stated that need, which is oftentimes wait lists that you have for people that have applied for or you you haven't been able to serve in a, in a prior year. Um, so you you know again you have a a pool of applicants. Um, and how you decide that you're going to serve them is there's there's different ways of doing it. It can be first come first serve. It can be you getting the first you know you know just addressing the people on the wait list first or the first ten people on the wait list. There's lotteries. There's project ranking way, um, uh, ways of of identifying the people with the greatest need. Again, that'll be a policy that you'll you'll want to establish and, and stick with. Um, so when, once you do that, we have standardized uh, applications um, that we send out to, to homeowners that includes the, the step-by-step procedures, the uh, general information guidelines, uh, it lists, you know, there's a cover letter that lists the forms of application and documents that you'll need, they'll need in order to establish that they are uh, low to moderate income. Um, things like bank stuff, uh, uh, pay stubs, bank statements, um, taxes if they're self-employed. There's a whole slew of, of uh, possible um, uh, sources of income. Um, this is one of those things that uh, a, whole, a whole day could be spent on verifying income. Um, so I won't, I won't delve into that too much. Uh, but once, you, you know, once, once you've established someone is, is um, income eligible, um, well, along with that application, sorry, along with that application, you know, it'll list things like you need to you need to provide us with a deed so you you have clear ownership of the property, that uh, you know you have homeowners insurance, uh, the taxes are up to date, you know whether it's real estate taxes, sewer, water taxes, um, that there are no municipal liens on the property. Um, you, we usually give people a deadline to get their applications in because sometimes they sit out there for a long time, especially if you're dealing with a wait list. And someone just hangs on to it, so we'll give it a deadline um, to get applications in. And um, once we get applications, we run through, make sure you know we make sure all the documents are there, make sure that they're income qualified. Um, sometimes things are, we don't have everything, but if we have enough, we uh, we set up an intake appointment. We bring um, homeowners into the office. Actually, now we've been doing mostly through Zoom or phone calls, um, but we meet with them to sort of go over the program again. Make sure that they they understand the process, um, and then sort of nail down some of the the, the miscellaneous you know documents that they may need. Um, but once that, that we get through that process and they're approved, 
um, we set up an initial inspection. Now I will, you know, there's, I'm going to com combine that with the, the two, there's, there's two topics here. One, one is lead paint testing and one is the, the inspection. Um, with this money, it's, uh, it's, the money comes down through HUD. Um, we do have to abide by the HUD lead, lead, uh, lead safe housing rule and by mass regulations. Um, and this is a topic that's, that's discussed <laughs> to death. Um, and again, it can be a whole day or a couple days um, uh, uh, we could spend on this. Um, but you will need to do lead testing on houses that are built before 1978. Um, and depending on the household makeup, if there's children under six years old, uh, depending on how much money you're spending on a house, um, uh, there's thresholds that sort of trigger certain certain regulations. Um, you'll need to identify those hazards um, and in incorporate them into your your work write up, uh, which I'll I'll touch on in a second. Uh, I will say that you know the way we do it, we we put out a, a request for proposals to uh, lead inspectors, um, and in that re that request for proposal or RFP includes um, some. Some language about um, their familiarity with the uh, the federal um, HUD HUD rules, so that they understand that we have to meet whatever the stricter of the two are, um, whether it's mass lead the mass lead law or the lead safe HUD lead safe housing rule. We have to sort of establish a path that that always is sort of looking at what the the most the most strict regulation is and abide by that. Um, so I'll go back to, so, uh, so once, you know, you can either do a lead inspection, you can call for a lead inspection before you go out to a, uh, a house, or you can, you can call for it after you go out for a house. We've done it both ways. We're now back to doing it before we go out to a house so that you know, we, we sort of get an idea what, what a um, homeowner is applying for, um, what kind of rehab work they're applying for. And you know, without going to the house, this isn't necessarily the best way to do it. Doug might have a different a different opinion. This I'll let him chime in when the time comes. Um, but we'll try to establish, you know, what they're looking for. Tell the lead inspector this is what you know, the, what kind of work we're expecting to do there. They go out and do their inspections, and then we get a, a, a lead inspection report that lists the hazards that we need to address. Um, and you'll you'll want to establish a good relationship with lead inspectors so that they're you know you can nail down exactly what you're looking what you want to do and what they're going to require in order to get lead clearance at the end of the end of the project. Um, but with that in hand, uh, we'll do a, a, a an inspection of the property. Um, most programs um, have to. Um, oh, I see something in the chat room. Um, that says, can CDBG funds be used for, to remove lead paint? Yes, absolutely. It's 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 pretty much required. <laughs> um, so um, <clears throat> anyway, the, the initial in, uh, comprehensive inspection that we do uh, doesn't. You know, we do an inspection of the property that will identify any any um, state sanitary code violations. That's 105 CMR 410, which are the minimum standards for fitness and human habitation. Uh, we'll identify those those things when we do an inspection. Um, you'll want to have an inspection report. Uh, we have one that lists the, the code violations and, and then, the, uh, you know, whether conforming or non-conforming and any comments off to the side if there's a non-conforming, um, um, but, you know, there's a violation there. So uh, we also include energy efficiency upgrades too. Um, in this program, they're requiring us to do, to replace products with Energy Star products. Um, and use energy, energy, energy star standards um, when we do things like insulation or, or um, uh, weatherization or something like that. Yeah. Brian, um, the, yeah. we have another quick question, but I think we're going to hold, I'll collect all the questions and then when you're done, we'll answer because I can. Okay, I'll so try to move along. Okay, thanks. Okay, did you have a, a question that you want me to answer right now? Sure, why not? Can they, can CDBG funds be used for well issues? Yes. Yes. I, I always, I always want to explain it as, you know, anything that goes into a house as a, as a, all the systems that go into a house. So it's, it's septic systems, it's wells, it's heating systems. Um, it's, you know, windows, it's roofs, it's insulation, it's electrical, it's plumbing, um, all those things. It is not a remodeling program um, that needs to be made clear. That's one of the things that, you know, we, you know, a lot of times owners, or homeowners apply to us 
And when we're going out there doing the inspection, they're pointing out things that they may want to do um, that sort of fall into that sort of remodeling category. You know, we're looking at, you know, we can't go outside the footprint of the house unless there's something like the, an accessible bathroom that you're trying to put in or something like that. But you, you have to stick with the footprint of the house and you're, you're replacing the components of the house itself. Um, so not knocking down walls, not, you know, opening up this, this wall that, you know, so that we have a more, you know, open floor plan, that sort of thing uh, can't be done. So we're, we're typically trying to play, replace in kind with in kind. Um, having said that, there are, um, you know, there are, are some energy product, energy star products that we put in that are a step above what is, what is there right now. Um, but so, you know, when you, when we do an inspection, um, we'll go over what the owners are looking to have done um, and also tell them that, you know, the sort of things that we need to address uh, in order to be in compliance with DHCD. They, they, they want us to correct the uh, sanitary code violations, like I said, any other code issues, and then do energy star upgrades, which uh, are, are, you know, energy efficiency upgrades. Um, and that may, they may take a, a lower, you know, it depends on, you know, as, as everyone here, you know, like Chris and Patricia can uh, attest to, and Doug can attest to, is that, you know, the, the, the cost of doing these jobs has gone up and up and up and up. Um, and, you know, materials are going up and up and up. And so we're, we're having to sort of scale back on some things while also meeting, you know, being in compliance with DHE's, you know, expectations of correcting code violations. Um, so no, nothing frivolous is being done. Um, not that it ever was. Uh, um, anyway, so, you know, when we, we you know, we do the inspections um, and do, a, uh, you know, develop a work write up that will be, um, you know, sent to the, the homeowner. Sometimes we, we used to go meet with them and sit down and go over what we've written up uh, that will go into the, the bid packets um, that will eventually be developed and sent out to contractors. But there's a little back and forth and sort of, you know, zeroing in on exactly what the product, the project's gonna in include. Um, and, you know, sometimes things have to get ironed out and you have to go back a few times maybe um, just to sort of settle on on the scope of the project so that when you put together, a, you know, a bid packet that everyone is bidding on the same thing. There has to be open and fair competition with this with these projects. So um, it's very important to, to have a work right up that, that has performance standards and materials um, that the owner signs off on um, so that when it goes out to bid, you know, you everyone is bidding on, again, the same thing. Um, so, it, and, and then when you're developing that, we also develop a cost estimate to ensure cost reasonableness on these projects. Another, um, another uh, requirement of DHCD is that you're, you know, you're ensuring that this, you know, the project is within a range that you think it should be in. Um, there are some, um, some programs that are useful in developing cost estimates and work write-ups. Um, I believe that Doug um, uses a, a, a housing developer pro, with, um, which we have also. You have to tweak it a lot. And I believe Doug has done a lot of tweaking and I'd be interested in sort of getting that one day from him. Um, uh, because that program actually comes from the South and you'll see a lot of things that are, that are sort of pertinent to the South. Um, but anyway, so, so once you, you develop a bid packet, um, you're going to have a, you know, a lot of places that would do this differently. The, the contractor selection process is a little different everywhere. You can have a pool of contractors that you always send these bids out to. You can have a combination of, you know, some, you send it to three of those contractors and you send it, um, you, you also send it to, or it, it goes to the homeowner and they can, they can identify contractors that may want to bid on the project themselves, as long as they're licensed and insured, they have all the proper, you know, whether it's their lead license or just a contractor's license or plumber's license, what, what have you, we'll list all the licenses that are, that are required in the bid packet for them to bid on a job. Um, and so they can, it can be opened up to people beyond a contractor list that you may have that is an eligible contractor's list that you've, you know, you've, you've gotten all the information, all the uh, insurance certificates from them, workers comp licenses and all that. So you have a, a, a list of contractors that you can, you can send um, 
send uh, bid packets to. Again, there's there's different ways of doing that, um, but you just want to always ensure that you're you know you're you maintain an open and fair competition. Um, some some places also I know a lot of places actually have walkthroughs with contractors. Uh, well, you'll you know once you identified your contractor pool of people that are going to be bidding on the job, where you have a, an appointment where everyone comes at one day and walks through the house and any kind of questions are raised and then and anything any clarifications that are needed are are, are distributed to to those contractors uh, once they you know the rehab specialist or whoever else whoever's running the job um, will you know can once they they can answer those questions uh, even if it's a question that's raised that day and answered that day usually that's set up, that's sent out to all the contractors and there's an acknowledgement that they've received that information and there may be an addenda uh or addendum to the bits the bid specs that everyone will have to acknowledge that they received um when the you know when they submit their bids um there's always a bid due date um sometimes that gets, gets extended depending on you know various things um and so bids are always due at a certain time and a certain date and they're open that then that on that date um once the uh, the lowest qualified bidder is identified, um, we will send out a notice to the other contractors uh, that lists all the bids that were received, what their what their prices were, um, and, and identify the the winning bidder. Uh, and once they accept that, as the you know the, that contractor accepts the bid, um, then well, not accepts the bid, but acknowledges that they are the winning bidder and they're going to go through the project. Uh, we, we have standardized contracts that they that they uh, they need to sign. It's a contract between the home, homeowners and the con and the contractors. Um, and it can be done in different ways. Oftentimes it's the owner and the contractor getting together and, and, and signing those contracts. Within those contracts are the bid specs that were put out, you know, the the um, with the bid packet and then other legal legal stuff in a contract um but again there's there's standardized contracts uh and also in, you know those con the contract packet will include lien releases um you know at the end of a project you, you're going to want to have a, what's called a clean lien so that no one can can place a lien on the project when it's completed um for uh, failure to pay for materials or failure to pay for labor on that job um, it'll include sign outs from different municipal inspectors whether it's uh, electrical inspectors plumbing inspector, building inspector, lead inspector, um, and it'll include also the pay schedule. Um, and once those contracts are signed, we, we, uh, we hold a loan closing um, with the owners. Um, and, you know, these are the way that this is set up with us is that they're deferred payment, 0% deferred payment loans. Uh, they can record it against the property that uh, get uh, forgiven over the course of 15 years. Um, so, and after 15 years, they owe nothing. Um, so we hold a, a loan closing. There's a, a right of rescission period for them, you know, owners to back out of the project or the, the loan for three days. And then after that period expires, we send out notices to proceed to the contractor, um, which again, include, you know, list this, the schedule of payments and, and, um, various processes and, and sign offs with that, um, with the notice just as one more layer of protection so um so that's sort of it in a nutshell i'm sorry that took lo way longer than uh than i had a lot been allotted um so i'm going to pass it off to doug from here if i could uh from the point of, of notice uh, notice to proceed going out to a contractor yeah go move on let's hear <laughs> and i know there's going to be some questions at the end of this so we'll hopefully get time to circle back all right so um, after the notice proceed is sent, it, construction delays or, or construction startup issues, um, it varies greatly because I deal with, um, you know, from the hill towns all the way down to Quincy to Brockton, I deal with entitlement, I deal with the, um, and, and the semi entitlements also. And um, I'm finding contract, so, for instance, out in the mountain area, the hill towns, we have two regular contractors, maybe three. So the first delay we're going to get is how many jobs are these guys already doing for us? Now, in Newton, we've got 18 contractors. So the delay is much different. Um, 
the pandemic though has changed things in the in the fact of trying to get materials uh, some of the windows and doors are now two months out where they used to just be two weeks out and um the getting materials like pressure treated lumber has been very difficult we just did a, a porch up in greenfield and we had to go to three different lumber yards to get the material it's starting to get a little bit better but again the prices have doubled or close to doubling from what I'm finding. I'm finding that those to be the worst startup delays is gonna be, depending on what community, how many guys you have working for you, and then can we get the material? Um, homeowners clearing up workspaces. I don't run into too many issues with that unless we're dealing with the lead paint issues. Um, we don't have the contractors move homeowners' personal belongings because that's when they come back and say, you broke my TV, you broke my bureau, you broke my bed. So we usually, unless they're an elderly individual and absolutely have no help at all, they're responsible for moving their own furniture. And I usually have to go and keep pressuring them, say, listen, we're starting Monday and you haven't moved anything yet. So that's an ongoing issue there. Um, change orders. Unless it's a straight up lead project, almost every job has a change order to it some some form or another you know so um, again what I do is if uh, if you have a change order you need to call me now because I work in seven different communities um, maybe I'm in the hill towns on a Friday and I get a call from a guy in Brockton who says hey I just stripped the roof and the sheathing's all rotted I'll make him step off the roof take a picture of the with a cell phone take a picture of the front of house send it to me immediately so I know that's where he really is and then get back up on the roof and send me pictures of the rotted plywood. And then we can discuss the price over the phone so we can give a verbal to keep moving forward. Um, the side deals between the um, homeowner contractors. I always say, if you want to do a side deal, that's great, but that's done after our job is done. No, no work can be touched. And I don't even want to know that it exists because I'll set the job down if they do, because it's nothing but a headache. So if you're gonna do a side job with my contractors, my contractors know that if I find out they're doing a side or a side deal, that they're gonna get suspended for at least one or two bids. Um, so they, they won't do it until, again, once the job's done, I don't care how many side deals they do. At that point, you know, we're done with our stuff, so it doesn't matter. Any questions? I don't know, I don't know what else you wanna know. <laughs> I think that's, I think that's great, Doug. Um, you know, um, there, there probably could be some questions from folks, but um, I'm, I'm hoping to let Chris um, Dumpy talk a little bit about the kinds of projects that um, maybe the, I asked him to talk about, um, about the, the, uh, the great ones, but if he has a few that are not so great that he'd like to discuss, that's okay too. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm just going to back up a little bit and talk a, a couple things about what Brian and, and, and Doug and Patricia were saying. Uh, so first of all, um, the DHCD, well, HUD has their own uh, programmatic uh, challenges and, and a plethora of materials on that we have to adhere to. And then the DHCD has a manual you know, a, a housing rehab manual that we must adhere to. And each and every agency or, or municipality that's uh, administering a housing rehab program will have a manual of their own, as you see. So th this is ours, uh, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission's Housing Rehabilitation Manual, just filled with forms and processes and, and everything. So this is a very complex program with lots of different uh, um, aspects to, to to deal with everything from uh, the HUD uh, lead paint, which is different from the, the mass lead paint. Uh, and uh, so it's very, very, very complex. And, and we're trying to do these uh, within a restricted amount of funding that's allowed through the program. Uh, so in terms of successes, let me just say that this, and, and Doug and Brian and Patricia, they'll agree. If you can get through a housing rehab program within a relatively short period of time, okay, that addresses the, the, the state uh, health uh, uh, um, building code manual and the homeowner's happy, that is a success. I mean, you know, we're not doing better homes and garden projects. 
okay? Uh, we're, we're not looking to see our projects appear in, in fancy magazines, because you know what? We are not doing remodeling. And that's the first thing that we have to try to uh, train or coach our, our clients. If you're coming into this program for fancy bathrooms and kitchens, you've come to the wrong place. We are trying to put back uh, code issues that have failed you know, in the realm of, yes, we can do some work in bathrooms and, and kitchens and whatnot, but, you know, if it's a flooring issue, you know, we're probably not going to be doing hardwood floors or, or, or fancy towel. We're going to get you a smooth, flat surface that meets the code, you know, um, and in terms of the, the products themselves that go into a project, no, we're not going to, you know, spec the cheapest things either, but we're not doing custom, okay? So, Clarifying what this program can do to the clients or for the clients on the onset of, of a project is very, very important. So they know uh, what they're getting into and not to have great expectations for some sort of remodeling or, or, or expansion. We're not doing, as, as Brian pointed out, we're not changing the footprint uh, of these properties either, you know, because there's the environmental uh, review, which deals with the historic concerns. And so very, very, very complex. But I will share two recent projects that I think had a, a, had a, a good ending for, for our clients, okay? So the first one, um, not too long ago, um, sadly, we were dealing with a, in a client that, that was being abused, you know, in the household. And the abuser actually was incarcerated. But that abuser was actually an owner of the house. So there are forms and processes, okay? Brian mentioned something about a lien. As part of our program, if we're gonna be filing a lien on the house, okay, it has to be notarized and approved by the homeowners of that house. So here we are trying to deal with a very, very complex situation. Uh, and, and, you know, a, a large part of this project was putting on a roof uh, because there was literally water pouring in through the house. But, but one of the, the owners was presently incarcerated, but uh, there was a social worker involved as well. So the social worker actually tipped me off and said, hey, look, this person is gonna be in such and such a court on this day and he's willing to talk to you. So I, I packed up my uh, one of my coworkers who happens to be a licensed notary public. And I said, come on, let's, we're going for a ride. And we went to that courthouse. We met with that, uh, uh, that person and who was fortunately willing to sign the paperwork so we could sort of close the lien and make this, this project happen for this woman. So um, although it wasn't, you know, the housing rehab work in itself wasn't dramatic, but the, you know, what we were able to do and, and to try and make that happen was a, a, a success, success. So that was one project. Now a completely new, different one, which, which I'm right now, right presently beginning to wrap up, okay? So it was last year um, we had lined up this two family household. Uh, one of the units uh, was occupied with the children under six and who had been uh, led, you know, uh, tested in the schools as having traces of lead paint in his, his system. So, well, right then and there, that's a concern. You want to do what you can, you know? So we went forward and uh, we did the initial ins inspection with the rehab specialist. And right off the bat, they said, you know, to come into compliance, this is, this is going to be a $110,000, $120,000 project, which exceeds the allowable cost through the state program. As uh, some of us know that administer this, we're allowed to go up to $40,000 per unit without getting special uh, waivers, you know, to proceed. So uh, that was problem one. Okay, two units, $120,000 project, now what? And, and the program that I had open at the time was running out of money, you know? So the first thing that I did is, uh, this was the FY18 program, running out of money, big project comes in, we wanna help. So as luck would have it, I had a FY17 program in that same community that was still open and it had an uncommitted amount of money for like an infrastructure project, you know? So we were able to complete an infrastructure project under budget. I, there was excess money. So my first thing was, oh, called the state and said, hey, look, I'd like to extend the FY17 grant and then ask you to create a new program within that grant. So the grant was originally just infrastructure. So the DHCD allowed us to extend, 
allowed us to reprogram that unused money to create a housing rehab program within that grant year. Okay, so so the funding challenge was partly resolved at this point in time. Okay, so then we pressed on and, and, and we finally got a bid out the door. And yes, the bid did come around one hundred and nineteen thousand dollars, wouldn't you know, for the two units. I said, okay, well, let's find someone that's qualified, has the proper lead credentials and everything. And, and you know, we did. And, and then what happened in March? Well, COVID hit, okay? <laughs> and then the extension was only good for June. So that was one concern, uh, COVID hit. And then the contractor um, that bid told us, you know, a couple months in after COVID, look, we're, we're shutting down. And, and the guy that has the lead paint credential left us. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, I got all this money into place, had the programs extended. Uh, then the lead guy says, oh, I can't do it because my lead guy left and we're shutting down. A month or two passed, we got a call back saying that we were able to uh, marry one of our other contractors who had the lead paint credentials with this, with this particular firm that was the low bid and uh, we got them on board. And lo and behold, we were actually able to start the project in July with, a, with, a, with the waiver, the single case waiver, the brand new round of extensions. And because it was an FY17 program, there actually ha had to be a contract extension. And so, uh, you know, lo and behold, we managed to pull it all together. And right now we're just working on punch lists and, and wrapping up the project. So where there's a will, there's a way. And uh, the, the state officials, uh, the friends at the DHCD, they will cooperate with you if you present a, a logical um, reason why this particular project should move on. So that being said, another success, um, actually, depending on how you want to look at it, from a programmatic point of view, is sometimes not getting into a project that you shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I recently had experience, Keith and I had gone on to a, a site visits when, within his community and identified one such possible project. There was a person on the, the waiting list and the needs were so extensive to uh, um, deferred maintenance and, and a whole list of, of different issues that were observed on our site visit. And uh, right now we're, we're evaluating if that should proceed because we, we'd just be opening up a can of words, worms that cannot be resolved. So sometimes, unfortunately, a success is knowing when not to actually do a project. And this is what you learn after the 30 years of experience Brian has, and he'll attest that there are some that you just unfortunately may have to move on. So. Those are a couple successes and, uh, and welcome to the world of housing rehab. <laughs> um, this is so much information. I really wanna thank this panel. Um, we, we do have a few questions, but I can, I've certainly learned a ton about just how much work this is. And you've certainly got me thinking about, you know, I know there's some folks from DHCD on the call and, thoughts about maybe lowering thresholds for you know, facilitating this process, making it as smooth as possible while you know, making sure the money's going to the right places. Two questions came in that I'd love to hear from the panel. Um, given that lead removal can be such a big expense, um, one was uh, looking for other sources. Um, Keith asked a question about going directly to the EPA and other sources and someone had a response to that. And then another question was, if there are children in the family and lead is identified, um, can that household back out at that point if it seems like too big a job or um, what, how does, so any more info about balancing the huge cost of the lead removal with the other needs in the household. So I don't know who wants to take that. Chime in on uh, uh, both of them quickly. Um, HUD does have a Healthy Homes lead paint grant, uh, strictly for lead paint removal. It's a complicated grant. I work with it in Quincy and Brockton, and you do have to do a certain number of projects within each quarter. So it can be very confusing. That's probably not good for one community unless you're a big city like Quincy or Brockton. But if several communities get together, they can they may be able to apply as as like you do with your CDBG programs. I'm not sure, but you may be able to apply and say, 
let's do this. So we probably do um, 20 to 40 lead projects per year between Quincy and Brockton through the lead paint program. And they also give an additional five grand per unit for healthy homes on top of the lead, which can help take care of some rehab issues. And then as far as the child under six, um, they can back out. Massachusetts law does say that any house with a child under six is supposed to be deleted. Um, the lead police will not come knocking on your door, even if you have a report, unless the child's elevated, has an elevated level. So there are times when we do, we do tell the clients that they are responsible to let on their own if they back out. But again, the state's not gonna come kicking in their door saying, oh, we got a lead report now, you better do this, unless there's an elevated level. And then they're gonna make you do it anyways. And then they, you know, there is also um, uh, get the lead out program to help offset some of the lead costs, which is a whole nother set of um, hurdles sometimes for a homeowner. But that is another funding source for the lead. Yeah. I just want to follow up on what Doug is saying. Like, first of all, a question came from Susan. The, can CDBG funds be used to remove lead? Well, CDBG funds can be used to address the, the, the issues of lead paint, but it doesn't always mean removal. And uh, Doug and Brian can maybe go into this a little bit more, but depending on the factors, you know, it could be in, in some cases encapsulation, you know, and that's a treatment. So you're not actually removing it. It's still there, uh, you know, but, you know, it, it's dealt with in a different way. And yes, uh, Wayfinders here in Springfield, Mass does have a get the lead out program. And uh, I believe it, 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 it operates somewhat as a deferred loan as well. Um, and I do have a project that, you know, in order to make it work, like we're constantly running into older, older homes, historic homes, where the CDBG program, we're not gonna, we're not gonna take a historic home and, and just take off all the, all the, the siding and put up vinyl siding. No, we're not allowed to do that. You know, we have to actually address the lead. And in doing that, it does elevate or raise the, the overall cost of a project to a point that we may not be able to do it. So in this one particular instance, I have referred Referred the, the client to uh, Wayfinders, get the lead out. I said, look, try to apply for them, get this lead work done, and then come back to us and we'll address the, address the remaining uh, the code issues of your property. So I do encourage people to definitely look up Wayfinders, get the lead out. I think Doug and I, didn't we attend a workshop some time ago in uh, Pittsfield or something where they, they were talking about the EPA thing? The very complex. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, uh, right, right. Yeah. 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 We're not able to apply, but municipalities can, and they could they could band together other municipalities to make it worthwhile. But if my understanding is, is quite an onerous grant application, and, and there's a lot that goes into that particular EPA grant, if it even is still available. But it, I would say in this available. area, get the lead out is is going to be one of your. Uh, is there another organization up north that, that like we have wayfinders down there? Does wayfinders serve up in Franklin? Uh, yeah, so get the let out program is through the through Mass Housing and Mass Housing Finance Agency. It's a statewide program, and so um, there are local rehab agencies, LRAs, which we are one of. Um, there's no real turf per se. Um, there are eligible, there are um, participating lenders also. There's a list if you go on Mass Housing's website under the Home Ownership tab. There's a get the let out program in there, and it'll, it'll list local rehab agencies and it'll list participating uh, lenders in the area. So it's, it's, um, it is available throughout the state. And um, we often do piggyback some of our, our rehab projects with the Get the Let Out program uh, um, in order to, to make it work. I wanna make sure we get to this other question because I know there's, so it's about around handicapped accessibility. Can CDBG funds be used to make a house accessible and how do you balance those costs with the lead costs? Um, and I know there's also some other sources relative to uh, making things handicapped accessible. Yes, it, it is eligible. Um, it's an eligible expense um, to make modifications. Uh, they are sort of, I don't know that it really came through quite yet, but they're looking at um, aging in place type of improvements also. So you wouldn't have to necessarily be handicapped in order to, to apply for that. But that, that again, is, you know, it comes back to the, the funding level. You know, if it's gonna stay at $40,000, you're dealing with 
lead paint first. That's like, that's the first thing is lead paint when it comes to CDBG. Um, and you might not have money to do these other things. And that's, that's, that's hard to tell people sometimes, you know, they don't necessarily want to have to address this lead paint when they have an accessibility issue. Um, having said that, the, you know, Chris sort of uh, alluded to the fact that we can go for waivers with the state if you have a, a project that it will exceed the $40,000. I don't think you just alluded to, you talked about it a little bit, but um, uh, that, you know, if you have, you know, you have to deal with lead issues and you also have uh, a household that needs some accessibility modifications, then you may, you can make an appeal to the state to, to exceed the maximum loan amount. There also is the um, home modification loan program, um, which uh, is strictly for accessibility improvements. And that's through um, CDAC, right? Is it CDAC? Yes. Right. That's yeah, what I was yeah. mention. Yep. Yeah. And so. Um, so CDAC are, is the, the state organization, but Pioneer Valley Planning Committee, like Brian, uh, right. helps manage to get the let out. The Pioneer Valley Planning Commission offers the home modification loan program throughout Western Mass. Uh, in addition, to Wayfinders does it as well. So. Right. And, and in the greater Boston area, that's Metro Housing Boston, or what yeah. it's, got, it's right. new name that I, I forget. Um, yeah, there's, yeah, there's like, I think there's like six provider agencies, right. which is one is Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. And we're actually under contract to be the construction monitor for PVPC's projects when they go through the home modification loan program. So we'll go out and but, do inspections. But for the audience, it's the home modification program. Is that also with, it's through CDAC, is that correct? Yes, it okay. is through CDAC. We'll see if we can find that link because that's an important one. So it's home modification loan program, HMLP that you've referred to it as. Got it. So it's, it's a, and it's the same, uh, it's a 0% deferred payment loan. It does not get forgiven over the course of time though. It's like you pay whatever, just right. like get the let out is that it's a, you know, whatever you, whatever you borrow is what you're going to owe when the house sells or transfers ownership right. be it next year, 10 years, 20 years down the line. So when we do get a house that is in need of some uh, home modifications for the purpose of, of accessibility, we will try to work with the homeowner and address things through CDBG as best as we can. Uh, but there may come a point, you know, that the, the needs again exceed the parameters of the CDBG program and a referral will have to occur to a home modification loan uh, to, to actually see that the work that they, they wanted gets done. But to back up on some what Doug was saying, we're very careful not to like co-mingle projects at the same time, which could be get very, very confusing for the homeowner and for us as an administrating agency. Oh, well, you know, like in the case, like Doug saying the homeowner wanted to do some sort of separate deal with the contractor. Absolutely not. Because, you know, if that happens, they're going to want to ultimately in their mind, co-mingle what happened on their private deal with your project that you're managing in. So that is something that you definitely want to avoid as best you can is co-mingling different projects at the same time or different sources of funds. Okay, Absolutely. we're getting some great, I think, you know, this is, we, we have a few minutes if people have other questions. This is obviously super highly technical information and you guys have really encapsulated it so well. So I, I really appreciate that. So if I don't see any more questions, we have a few more minutes. I'm gonna, um, I just wanna make sure we get one more opportunity at, at MHP to thank everyone who helped us put this all together. And um, again, invite um, your questions to us. We can certainly get them back out to these panelists and to the panelists we've had before. So um, we're hopeful that we can continue to work in Western Mass and, um, oh wait, quest, quick question. How often can someone get the modification if they have several big projects? Is that for an, an individual homeowner? I'm not sure I understand that question. Uh, let's see. I guess I'm not sure, Katie, the logistics of inviting them to speak. It says, how often can someone get the modification if they have several projects? And perhaps that's a single, you know, can there be repeat clients or, or is that from an, an agency? We don't have a strict policy um, here at the PVPC, but most definitely it, it, we're not going to want, we're, this is not a maintenance program. So again, it's not a remodeling program. It's not yeah. a maintenance program. I so suspect 
the question is given so this case they just typed in it's septic lead ADA so given that you have a cost threshold can you come back and do it in chunks technically you can yes um, we try to you know if we have a, a wait list in the town uh, we'll you know someone goes through the program one year depending on what their need is in the following year, if they have a, a failed septic system, then it's gonna to rise to the top, of course. Uh, but there are, if there are things that we didn't do the prior year that maybe you know, were of less importance to the, some of the stuff we did then, and then we have people that are on a wait list that have you know, serious needs, then we'll, we'll address those folks, those folks first. Mm -hmm. um, I did wanna, before we end, I don't know if this is the time, but I did wanna go back on, on um, the the lead report is some you know someone had a lead report done or had lead inspection done um and they back out of the program i just wanted to be want them to be sure that they're like they understand that yeah doug's right they're not going to come knocking on your door but there will be a lead report on record and if and if you decide to have someone who isn't qualified to do that work um do some of that work if, if your intent it always comes back to this intent thing with 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 um, uh, mass D DPH is what, what is your intent if you're going to, if you decide you're gonna replace your windows because you wanna minimize the lead, you know, lead exposure in your house and you have a lead report done on already that's on record, then you're, you may get in trouble at that point. They may, they may consider that to be unauthorized deleting. So just be careful if you have a report on what you're gonna to do to your house if you decide to back out of a program. Um, just, just wanted to put that out there. That was a great answer. <laughs> and again, the um, the audience is submitting some terrific, helpful comments um, as this goes along. So um, Katie, I can't remember how you save the chat if people want to save the, the links that people are sending in this. Yes, so you can, uh, there should be like three dots at the top of the chat. Oh yeah, there you go. Or at the bottom, sorry. And yeah. you can say save chat. Yeah. Well, with that, we're just at time. But again, this has been an amazing panel. And I'm, I'm so grateful you could take time out of what's obviously an insane season for CDBG in, in every possible way. Um, so good luck, you guys. And um, thank you for everything you do. Thank you so, for everything you do, too. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks yeah. for having us. Okay. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you very much. Bye, Bye all. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Later, Please call thank if you. you have questions that I might be able to answer. Take care. Bye.